We need to see, we desperately need to see a turnaround in the Met market. And we really haven't had any price discovery all summer. Like the, the, the cargoes that are, they're causing spot prices to move down. And you also have to keep in mind spot volume is maybe 3% of the global market. So we have traders and end users who are, you know, traders are reselling cargoes uh, that they loaded up on, you know, ahead of, um, ahead of Indian elections, for instance. Yeah. Uh, and, then, and then also around the Grosvenor fire, uh, which occurred back on July 1, uh, you know, that the Anglo has enough tons of Grosvenor to ship through the end of September. So we haven't seen enough, you know, uh, demand or purchases from, you know, from direct from producer to end user in the market to know really what the price of, of a, you know, a, a real cargo of new fresh mined coking coal really is. Uh, I think we will see that here over the course of the next month. Um, and it'll, you know, put a four under. Matt Warder, what's going on? How are you doing? I'm doing good, Andy. How are you doing, buddy? Doing good. Good, really good to see you. Uh, last time we talked, it was about two weeks ago. You were on your way to Boston. I called you in your car. How was your yeah. vacation? Uh, much needed really, but of course, you know, uh, it was, uh, it, my timing was impeccable because, uh, you know, it coincided with the, uh, typical August rug pull and, uh, and coking coal markets. And yeah. so, uh, you know, there's much panic pretty much like right on the day that I left there. Um, it, you know, so like I told people, it's pretty seasonal for, for this to happen. It's just that, you know, with, with China data as, uh, as miserable as it sort of looks, you know, the, the weakness that I think most analysts kind of thought was going to come around in 2025 got pulled forward and got pulled forward really fast. Um, so, you know, it's, it's been, uh, you know, a lot of playing catch up here. It's trying to get articles out whilst, you know, on the road on, on one screen and, uh, you know, with a, with a 10 year old, uh, little one, uh, nipping at my heels too. So it was a, it was a struggle, but we got through. Yeah. And texting and taking phone calls from guys like me. So yeah, um, yeah, that's, well, like I said, you know, I, I love talking about coal under any circumstances. So, uh, so always happy to do that. Yeah. Well, excellent. Great to great to see you. Um, but let's start working that out. Uh, yeah, bad news in China, but it's it's interesting though. I mean, it, the charts are, I guess, in coal specifically. And please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, they're down, but they're not. It could be so much worse, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, yeah, especially with the equities. Go ahead. Yeah, it's. I mean, there, there's, there's no two ways about it. Like this shoulder season has been an absolute wreck. Uh, you know, pretty much as soon as, uh, I think I tweeted out in January that, that the coking coal curve kind of looked long in the tooth. Uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, whenever that happens, there, there's so much beta associated with the names. Like you just have to, you know, kind of lighten up as, as shoulder season comes in. Uh, you know, I, I fully expected things to kind of bounce off the 225 level. And then we, they moved all the way down past it. Um, you know, but strangely, it's, it's not really, it's not really a demand problem, which is the, the, the difficulty. It's a, it's a pricing problem and it's specific to China. Their, their downstream demand is, has been pretty miserable on the real estate side. And, you know, they're still making a lot of steel. So they're importing, you know, more, more med coal than, than even I expected this year. Uh, just the problem is that the, the steel price domestically has deteriorated so much. It's turned all those producers underwater. And the only way that they can get out from under that is to is to you call that steel out into the global market. Um, and so now there is there's a situation where, you know, India's begun to import some uh, you know, some steel, which is kind of curbing the post monsoon season coking coal demand, I think a lot of us expected. Um, iron ore prices have been surprisingly resilient too. So that it doesn't, you know, clear up a, enough space in the in the cost profile of steel mills you know, for coking coal to hang in here, which is right around, uh, you know, current levels uh, on the East Coast for the U.S. are right around mine level. We need to see, we desperately need to see a turnaround in the Met market. And we really haven't had any price discovery all summer. Like the, the, the cargoes that are, they're causing spot prices to move down. And you also have to keep in mind spot volume is maybe 3% of the global market. So we have traders and end users who are, you know, traders are reselling cargoes. Uh, that they loaded up on, you know, ahead of um, ahead of Indian elections, for instance, yeah. uh, and then and then also around the Grosvenor fire, uh, which occurred back on July one, uh, you know that 
Anglo has enough tons of Grovener to ship through the end of September. So we haven't seen enough, you know, uh, demand or purchases from, you know, from direct from producer to end user in the market to know really what the price of, of a, you know, a, a real cargo of new fresh mined coking coal really is. Uh, I think we will see that here over the course of the next month. Um, and it'll, you know, put a floor under the market, whether it's so the likelihood that, that you can see additional price declines without also seeing production curtailments over time. We've gotten to the point where that's pretty unlikely. And then similarly in Australia, you know, some of those, some of those mines can make money down to 175, 170, 165. Uh, but then the question becomes much like Bao Wu uh, said in their, in their press release in China, you know, how much, you know, do you defend profits or do you defend your balance sheet? Um, and I, I think that, that the, you know, if, if conditions continue to flag like this, you'll start to see production cutbacks. You'll start to see uh, the market tighten itself. Uh, but, you know, the bottom line is the world's got to work through a pretty big glut of steel. Uh, and if we look back to 2014 as kind of the last time that, that, a, that a glut this big happened in China, it took about 12 months to 18 months to work through it. Um, I think we're about six months in right now. So, you know, maybe another, uh, you know, a, about another year's worth of, uh, of weakness. I'm going to put that in air quote. Yeah. Uh, to go. Um, but well, you know, if China stimulates, then that, that's a slight game change, right? Right. If they, if they try to, you know, induce, uh, you know, downstream demand, if they make more EVs and export EVs, if they make more air conditioners, if they, if they, you know, push the steel demand further downstream and export products, then there are some ways to sort of mitigate that that we've seen them do here over the last couple of years. And, uh, you know, honestly, we just have to wait and see. Uh, there was, there's nothing in the third plenary session to, to, you know, for us to hang our hat on. It was almost identical to the last one. So no mention of overcapacity, no mention of, uh, you know, cutting back on that. So, so I think you just have to, you know, eat it. Here, here at yeah. this point. And that, uh, that makes it difficult to really, you know, think about, you know, getting big in size for, uh, for what we're still going to see, you know, a, a fall restocking season where, where prices should inflect. Um, you know, the question is just how, how high will that go? Right. A lot of stuff going on there. Let me just address first, like, obviously, like you just mentioned, China, if they were to stimulate again, but it's also the Fed. And again, we're not economists, but we are investors and traders, if you would. So if the Fed starts cutting again, um, that would be a stimulant, but also the central banks around the world again, uh, start, start the printing presses again. So just to stimulate growth, that would be obviously very beneficial for, uh, for coal, um, and ste well, steel and this, this, um, uh, met coal. Mm -hmm. So really my question is here is obviously you said you thought we'd be bouncing around in here and then we're going into um, a good season, a restocking season. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, where do we go from here? What you see, is this a place for investors to start accumulating again or just accumulate with caution or yeah, not being raging bull or, or what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, with caution right now, we need to see, we desperately need to see a turnaround in the Met market. And we really haven't had any price discovery all summer. Like the, the, the cargoes that are, they're causing spot prices to move down. You also have to keep in mind spot volume is maybe 3% of the global market. So we have traders and end users who are, you know, traders are reselling cargoes uh, that they loaded up on, you know, ahead of, um, ahead of Indian elections, for instance. Yeah. Uh, and, then, and then also around the Grosvenor fire, uh, which occurred back on July 1, uh, you know, that the Anglo has enough tons of Grosvenor to ship through the end of September. So we haven't seen enough you know, uh, demand or purchases from, you know, from direct from producer to end user in the market to know really what the price of, of a, you know, a, a real cargo of new fresh mined coking coal really is. Uh, I think we will see that here over the course of the next month. Um, and it'll, you know, put a floor under the market, whether it's, you know, 195, 190, 185, it's hard to say exactly where the price is really meaningless until you get producers and end users actually transacting in the market. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, traders can't hold on to positions for very long. They're measuring, you know, like a lot of professional investors, they're measuring success on, you know, in weeks and months and quarters. Right. And uh, if you get too far off sides, well, you got to cut your position. Uh, and, and I understand that, you know, that's, 
it's not what I do. You know, I'm not a capital allocator. I do most of the, you know, my work in my 401k. So I'm, you know, short-term agnostic, uh, but, but even, you know, even I'm not, not sizing up quite yet, at least on, on the, on the names that are highly levered to, uh, to cold prices. Yeah. Got it. Let's talk about that. Then it's, would you be hanging out in just really the bigger, stronger names? Um, I've been assuming that would make sense as opposed to the smaller caps that seem to be a lot more speculative. Um, well, I mean, right now, you know, when we think about the U.S. landscape, for instance, you know, you have AMR that's, uh, you know, the buyback is, is off at the moment. You know, they're rebuilding their cash balance uh, and, you know, and we're waiting on Kobe coal prices to turn. When they turn, AMR, AMR share prices are going to turn with it uh, because that's, that's, that's how things work. Um, you know, when you look at Warrior, you know, Warrior is very cost protected on the bottom line. Um, you know, uh, I want to say that the Gulf Coast medical prices are probably about 192, uh, 193. Uh, and so, you know, that's, it's a little bit of a discount to, to PLB, but you know, every shoulder season, those relativities basically even out. Um, so, so I think, I think warriors kind of, you know, what you see is what you get at these levels. Uh, you know, I, sh- I should probably mention that, you know, if we do have like a global recession or a real pullback in markets or anything like that. In, in those cases, all stocks go down. So yeah, coal's going to go down with them. And, and uh, you know, me not being a macro you know, I don't know whether that's necessarily on the table or not, um, especially with interest, interest rate cuts around the corner. Um, it's, a, it's a very kind of touch and go uh, sort of moment. Um, you know, we, we just had a merger between Console and Art. And so, so their buybacks were turned off for a few months as we're heading into thermal coal shoulder season. Uh, but, uh, but med begins to restock. So it's, you know, whereas I thought, you know, console would be an absolute no brainer, I think for the back half of the year, when I did the work on them, uh, right around earnings, uh, you know, they, they deferred a bunch of exports that we're going to make up for in the back half. I mean, they're going to have a, a massive cash balance when this deal gets done in, um, you know, in early 25, but, you know, until then, I think, I think everybody's just, uh, you know, uh, market perform. Uh, there, there is one exception, um, I think, and that's, that's BTU. I think Peabody's pretty quickly moved up to the top of the list. Um, I was about them. Yeah, well, I mean, they have a hundred million dollars that they've dedicated that they have dedicated to buybacks. We know they're going to put that out into the market on a V one basis. Yeah, and you know, Elliot, the Elliot overhang is done, uh, and uh, and uh, some, uh, and then Thomas Capital uh, just initiated. Uh, you know, I hesitate to call it an activist position. Uh, you know, from from my conversations, uh, they're, they're pretty. They're, they're they're friendly. Um, you know, they, they just want to see uh, BTU communicate uh, the, the, the messages that the shareholders want to, you know, want to hear. You know, they want to hear about the shareholder return programs, maximizing value for assets, you know, whether or not they sell down a, a piece of Centurion a la Whitehaven here pretty recently. I think that's probably unclear. The, the real get over the longer term, which I think is a story that we all need to be talking about for a little bit is the the prospect of potentially building a new coal-fired power plant uh, on a almost on a mind mouth basis, close to uh, you know close to their PRB asset, and then pairing that with uh, with a data center of some sort. Uh, th- I think that's the the kind of secret sauce that nobody's you know nobody really had that on their uh, on their bingo card. At the beginning of the year, but with power demand going, you know, rising at three percent per year, and you know, demand for these data centers just going, uh, you know, through the roof, I, I think it is incumbent upon the industry to find creative ways to uh, to participate in that uplift, and that's uh, it's almost like a call option on the PRB, which had been left for dead. Uh, so that that I think is is a long term, very interesting, uh, you know, uh, narrative at least uh, for for. Uh, for Peabody going forward. Uh, and then separately, I, I think they're, uh, you know, the, the met, met operations in Australia are, are poised to do okay. The, the thermal coal operations are, are moving along well. Uh, even, even the U.S. Uh, mines are making these. So I think, I think BTU probably might be in the best position of, of anyone in North America here at the, at, at the current time. Well, I was going to jump into the stocks next, but let's uh, work those out, flush those out. But let's talk about your story, though, um, and it's really, you said data centers, but you could even say AI centers. 
Yeah, if you would. I'm assuming right. you have either what you're referring to or you could easily substitute that. Let's work that out. And how long of a story is that? And those centers, if you would, are going up everywhere. So how, I know that's a copper play, but how is that also a coal play in a mass? Well, it's, it really it's, it's a power to, it's a power to, right? play. Yeah. So the, the more data centers that we build, the, the more baseload generation that we're going to need in order to meet it. Uh, you know, one of the, one of the struggles of the energy transition has been uh, the inability of intermittent production to, you know, to scale in a meaningful way, you know, in, in function uh, without, without baseload backup. And, you know, it's one thing if power demand's growing at, you know, half a percent, one percent a year going forward. But if we're going to go at a multiple of that, you know, three to six times kind of a normal rate, uh, we can't also be retiring baseload coal facilities at the same pace. So something, something along those lines has got to give. Um, yeah, you know, there's, there's been a resurgence around nuclear talks. I think we are going to get, uh, you know, some new nuclear plants, whether that be, you know, a small modular reactor type of, uh, you know, type of build out via, you know, new scale or Oklo, uh, you know, more traditional facilities. Um, but it, you know, we're not building enough gas plants, you know, and in coal, which had been left for dead, um, you know, it, it's my view that if, if we want to at all meet carbon emission standards for the energy transition over the longer term, we've got to figure out capture and storage. And yep. we haven't had it. We haven't had an excuse to do that uh, at all because the facilities, you know, haven't, haven't, aren't located necessarily next to storage or you get logistics or transport involved and they suck a lot of money out of the, out of the supply chain as well. Um, but you have a really interesting situation in Wyoming, and I talked about this with uh, recently with Travis Detai, who's the, the president of the, of the Wyoming Coal Association. In Wyoming, you have kind of a convergence of three things. You got you got a lot of storage, uh, you got a lot of coal, and you got a lot of space and water. Uh, <laughs> and, and you know th those those things make a and a and a pretty reasonable interconnection too. Uh, right. The, the, that confluence of factors, I think, is pretty compelling to, uh, you know, perhaps use some of the credits available under the Inflation Reduction Act to actually try to do carbon capture and storage at scale in a singular project uh, for for once. And then, if we can prove that that works, you know, then then the lid's off. Then then we can think about instances where those the confluence of events might happen in uh the factors might happen in other regions as well but i think wyoming is a is a great place to start it because you got enough fuel and you got enough um uh you have the uh, support of the business community there and, and leaders uh, you've got a senator uh, ranking member on the energy committee and john barrasso um it's it, it's pretty interesting uh yeah. you mentioned mentioned how long i mean this is going to be years sure um but you know, there, there's no time like the present to start on on one of those projects. And I think, you know, it, it, I think there is a case to be made even to even to the progressive wing of the Democratic Party that we have to figure out all zero carbon uh, uh, generation potential. Uh, and if you know, there's there's no reason why we shouldn't build at least one project pair it with the data center so you offset demand. And then try to see if we can if we can crack the the carbon nut uh, that way because we do. I mean, we can we can export that technology to the rest of the world, and it's a game changer for you know for developing economies around the world to the extent that they can that they can store it. Uh, so sure. that's that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. Um, and and again, this is going to be a relatively long conversation, but I think it's one that we need to have just in general, uh, you know, in the energy community. Yeah, I would agree with you. Um, and I thought it, I never thought of it as a cop, I mean, a, uh, as a coal play, I thought of it as a copper play. But that leads me to ask you this question Would that be a thermal play or a met play for coal? A thermal. That would be, uh, you know, basically a call option on Cotter River Basin production. Uh, you know, and then there, there are two big mines out there there's, there's Peabody's uh, North Antelope Rochelle, and there's, uh, uh, well, now Arch and Consoles or Core Natural Resources, I guess, Black Thunder Mine out there. That's, that's a lot of production. That is that could be diverted to, you know, some some pretty meaningful, uh, uh, you know, data center demand should 
the parties be willing to accept it. That's a lot of cats to herd, but uh, you know, on the on the political side, on the uh, on the industrial side, um, and then on the on the producer and and, and yeah. utility side as well. Um, but you know, it's it's a worthwhile endeavor, I think. Is you know the the knock on effects of figuring that out would be, I think, pretty tremendous. Yeah, you need to get people talking. Um, it's also kind of I don't know what the right word is, but just last time we talked, we thought we talked about how the play was in met coal and, and thermal coal, not not so much, especially here in the U.S. But that's a complete reversal <laughs> of that. Well, that that one is. I mean, I I think you know. Uh, one of the comments I made last time was that, you know, thermal coal's pricing future is very much tied to natural gas and LNG. Yeah. So, you know, it, to the extent that, you know, you think natural gas prices are going to outperform, thermal coal prices can function as well, uh, you know, with regard. And there's a there's a cost for as well, uh, you know, here domestically in the U.S. So, uh, you know, you, you kind of you're a price taker, I think, in the thermal coal market longer term on, on MET. The, the thesis hasn't changed. It's just that we have, you know, a near-term risk in in uh, in Chinese demand, uh, and the the world is going to have to adjust for for that consumption here. You know, pr- probably over twelve months. Yeah, good info. Mm-hmm. So let's talk. Uh, let's talk some stocks here. You sure. talked about Peabody, and I actually um, I brought up charts um, right before, but also a week before we uh, were talking. Um, and that was an interesting chart just because it seems to me that just the chart alone, it seemed to me like there's some really good value there. Um, and it hasn't really gone much in three months, but it, and that's really good considering the nature of things. But then you're telling me that they, the buyback program that they have, well, just tell me about that. And, uh, that would be very bullish for the stock. And again, this is not investment advice, but just right guys. Well, it's, I mean. The, the buyback's going to put a floor under it. Now, whether that's at $20 or $21 or $22, you know, maybe right. that moves up over time. Uh, but Peabody's been one of the easier companies to trade. I mean, if you pull up, you know, a Bollinger Band and an RSI chart on it, mm-hmm. I mean, when it falls below the the bottom band, you know, usually RSI falls with it down to, you know, 40, 30, uh, and you just buy it there and sell it when when it hits the top. Uh, and you got, I mean, I'll just pull it back a year here. You've been able to do that. Uh, one, two, it's like a half a dozen eight, times, four, <laughs> five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, eleven, 11 times over times. the past year. <laughs> yeah, you, you've been able to do that. And, uh, you know, Peabody was, was a, was a company that I started a position in, you know, a while, a long while ago. And, uh, you know, it got up to 30 and we all, we all did a, you know, we did a celebration and then, you know, with Elliot's overhang, it's just been. Uh, you know, straight to, uh, you know, straight down at a 45 degree angle. I mean, not, not very far. I mean, down 20, 22. Right. Um, but it's, it's been surprisingly easy to risk manage given it's, it's relatively predictable volatility. Right. So for me, you know, I usually, uh, I've, I've sold puts on it just about every week for the last two years. Uh, Season one. And then, and then just and then just keep rolling it over, and then when they whenever they have a big move down, uh, you know, two or three standard deviation move down, just you know, start to size up a little bit into you know four or five six percent range, and then pull yeah. it back when it hits the top. That's kind of how I've been playing it over the last year, and it's been, you know, pretty low pretty stress dry. to be frank. Um, uh, you know, my cost position is just kind of zero uh, at this yeah. point in time, so it kind of I'm agnostic to what the share price is personally. Um, but, uh, but again, I, I think, I think you'll see that volatility sort of continue, uh, because it's really, you know, if you think about it from a liquidity standpoint, you know, if you're, if you're a larger fund or, or, uh, you know, a larger bank, this is really the only one you can, you can get, get enough liquidity for to establish a position in size. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, you know, the, the options market is really heavily active on it, uh, you, you can hedge it easier than, than a lot of other equities. And that's, that's a reason that it's, that it's bounced around, uh, you know, pinballed around as much as it has. Um, I, I've always thought that's almost an advantage for it. Um, but obviously, if you're, if you're more buy and hold long term, uh, it's been a frustrating hold, to say yeah. the least. Yeah. Well, I love that strategy. I actually use it all the time as also. But it has to be something you love or you want to hold long term, if you would. Just sell some puts to get a put to you. It is. 
it has so been annoying. annoying. <laughs> yeah, it's been pretty annoying and, and a lot of work to uh, to sort of hold on to over yeah. that period of time. But but now you know I, I do think they're moving into a different, a completely different environment with with the buyback underneath them, with Elliot gone, with the, an activist who's uh, you know helping. I think probably going to help management communicate uh, the things things that we want to hear. Uh, and, you know, to the extent that, uh, you know, they're motivated and incentivized to, uh, to participate, um, I think we'll have, uh, I think we'll have, you know, speculatively speaking, I think we'll have a pretty good next couple of years, despite, uh, you know, normalization in, in coal markets. Got it. Let's talk about uh, the big player, uh, Alphamed. Uh, again, they've sold off quite a bit. They had a great buyback uh, program that you mentioned on our previous talk. Um, that's been... Uh, I don't want to say suspended, but no longer happening. Um, I guess that would be a buy when they announce or when you expect them to announce to start buying back stock. And they'll do that when the stock gets really cheap or cheaper relative to what they uh, think it should be. I so, think, I, I mean, I think on our next calls, they've talked about, you know, having a $300 million cash balance as kind of a gosh. goal overall. Uh, you know, they, they hit that last quarter. Uh, even where coal prices are, they're going to make money this quarter. You know, it might not be a whole lot, but uh, they'll be they'll be cash positive. Um, and you know, I think probably if you see that that number get up to five hundred million, you know, cash balance, six hundred million cash balance, you'll see it probably come back on. Uh, yeah. it's a guess on my part, but um, you know, more importantly, I think right now is that you know a- AMR is is a company that. I know over the longer term, you know, provided that the Met, the long-term Met coal thesis remains intact, uh, is going to have a, an incredibly bright future just because there aren't many shares. I think average daily volumes, like maybe 200,000 shares. So, you know, we've had this, you know, 50% drawdown in price on comparatively little volume, uh, relative to, relative to the prior, you know, happenings. Uh, but without, without the buyback, putting a bid under it, you know, we're, we're back down here at 225, you know, for me thinking two years, three years, four years down the road. I mean, I like it at, you know, I liked it at 400. I like it at 350. I like 300, 250, pretty much whatever level, but you know, we're, we're still just not in a, in a period where you can confidently size up a met coal position and, uh, you know, and expect to, to really have a, a good go up. Yeah. For, for me, it's like, I need to see the med coal price turn and I need to see either some sort of China stimulus or China, you know, improvement in downstream demand uh, before I feel comfortable getting up to, you know, uh, you know, five, six, seven, ten percent position and then riding, you know, this wave up to, you know, when I typically, you know, rebalance quarterly in like January, February or something like that. Got it. Yeah. So it's, you know, wait and watch. Uh, it's fine. You know, I, I, I tend to buy a little bit whenever I put money into the 401k. And again, that's the only beagle I have really to do, uh, you know, any, uh, any, any long-term, you know, investing in size with, um, but uh, you, you know, it's, uh, you gotta be patient with it and you gotta be patient with the market and, uh, just, to, uh, you know, stick with it. And over, over the longer term, it'll, it'll be fine. But I think they're, if you needed to size up a cold position today, they're probably better avenues. Got it. Talk to me just really briefly about uh, Warrior. Uh, we talked about them last time. Um, same thing. Um, yeah, just tell me your thoughts. Just wait and see. Uh, yeah, yeah, Warrior is one of those companies, again, you know, over the longer term, we know it's going to be $120, $130, $140 stock at least. Uh, Blue Creek comes online, uh, you know, within the next... 12 to 24 months in pretty decent size. Uh, you know, the narrative has, has done very, very well for it. Um, everybody understands that Alabama has a cost advantage relative to the rest of the U S just, just because of transport. Right. Uh, and, uh, and the quality of the blue Creek coals get a slight premium over what you typically see for like us East coast low vaults. Um, you know, at times in the past, it's, it's been, uh, you know, blue Creek coal has been interchangeable with PLV. So, Market participants are more willing to pay premium uh, for for the higher CSR calls, uh, you know, like number seven uh, going forward. Now, Blue Creek is eyeball eight call. It's not, you know, it's not low vol, you know, super high, you know, CSR uh, production. So, um, 
Ivol, as time goes on, is going to wind up reverting to kind of historical discount to low vol, which is usually about 15%. Uh, if you think about volatile content for coking coals, low vols are typically about 20% volatile matter. So you, you heat it up in a coke oven, 20% of the, of the mass gets driven off as gas, right? Mm -hmm. uh, high vols are in the 30 to 35% range. So that, that delta, that 10 to 15% delta in the past has typically been the, the price discount that you see on high vol A's. I think over time, you know, as, as Blue Creek comes on and, and, the, uh, and you know, potentially if Longview ever returns to the market, although I'm not, not sure quite whether it's an A or a B, but the more high volatile material you have in the market or semi-soft, the, the generally bigger the discount that you'll also see. Um, so, you know, with, with that in mind, um, you know, I, I, think, I think Warrior is in a great position Call it by 2028 to be, you know, again, like 120, 130, uh, 140. We should be on the, the right side of the price cycle by that time. Um, but uh, but in the in the interim, you know, you have to watch, you know, the, the beta of med coal prices uh, and, and kind of judge that according. Um, right. Well, I'm comfortable, you know, accumulating it at 60 or 55 or 50. Um, but but again, if we get it, we get a position where, you know, uh, the, the market sells off, or if uh, you know if China data deteriorates further, uh, I mean you know you can't be surprised if it if it heads a little bit lower than uh, you know from here in the short term. So you know all all of these things really depend on you know your listeners' time frame and yep. how they're how they're measuring their their own success. Uh, yeah, and, and that sort of thing. and you know it's something I, I probably don't talk about enough on Twitter um, because you know I have other clients and things like that, but uh, you know we do get the kind of expound on those things here in longer formats. I uh, just want to make that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, any, any, again, they're not specific to a company, but any, anything that's interesting that is new and in, in the small cap space. And again, not specifically com com uh, company specific or ticker specific, I should say, but are you kicking around some tires or um, seeing yeah, what's well, out there? Well, I mean, there, there are a couple of things, uh, that that I think we might see here over the next month or so. I mean, really, the, the only things in the MET space that we have coming up, the only kind of events or catalysts are we have uh, U.S. domestic settlements that should come out here over the next few weeks. Uh, with prices globally at or near uh, what are my level costs for the high, higher quality material, uh, you know, the low volatile pools, um, you know, if I were a domestic producer, I would be concerned about production cut, particularly from undercapitalized, you know, smaller producers in central Appalachia, you know, small hundred to 300,000 ton a year operations. Uh, those, those are going to be the first ones to sort of fall by the wayside in terms of production. So if, if I'm a domestic U.S. steelmaker, I want to lock up as much low ball as I can and a price that is going to ensure that that supply will be there next year when, when I contract. Uh, I don't, I don't know if, if, if that is the prevailing sentiment amongst end users, mm -hmm. but you know, if I were advising them, I'd have some concerns about future availability. Um, if, you know, if you don't, if you don't provide a price that will, you know, ensure their well being for at least the next year. So, uh, you know, not necessarily saying that the U.S. domestic producers should, you know, pay a hefty premium for, for high quality domestic tons, but uh, I, I think they should, you know, maybe consider 170, you know, 165 low vol at the mine, which would, you know, if you take that out to the port, would imply like a $230 per ton average of coking coal for the coming year, uh, mm -hmm. which, you know, is still plausible. The curve's at about 225, right? Um, I think that's where people ought to set their marks. And I, I would suspect that, uh, you know, if you, if you, if you were to do that, you could probably settle pretty quickly. Now on the highball side, I think, I think the numbers are probably going to come down relative to last year. Uh, highball, I think last year settled around 145 for B cool and maybe 150, 155 for A. It was probably come down by five, uh, you know, five or 10 bucks. But, um, you know, when you pull it down by 20, all of those mines come up against their their uh, their cost profiles too. Yep. So 
So again, this is, a, you know, in a similar fashion to how coal producers, uh, you know, were sensitive to steelmakers needs last year as, you know, when they did these settlements, there was a looming UMWA strike or yeah, not UMWA, I'm sorry, United Steelworkers strike. Um, there was some uncertainty as to how well, how much they'd be able to produce. Uh, and, and they got a pretty good deal for the year. And, you know, the, the, the average price that they paid was well under what the global average was, you know, over the course of this year. Uh, so, you know, I, I think to, you know, recip a little reciprocation, uh, you know, for the next year, probably, uh, probably wouldn't be such a bad thing. So that, that's, that's kind of the, what I'm looking to see here over the next few weeks. Okay. Uh, it might work, might work out differently, but, uh, companies that have, that are levered more toward domestic production, um, uh, you know, from, from a ticker standpoint, you know, it'd be interesting to consider. And I think you can probably think a little bit about Corsa down here, okay. uh, CSO.V, uh, which is the only, you know, real micro cap that we have in the coal space, but they sell, you know, 70% of their production domestically. And if they get, they get a pretty reasonable price, uh, you know, 155, 160, they, they get a little discount because of their sulfur content. Uh, and they can get their costs under control down to like 130, 120, somewhere around in, in that area. From, they were 150 last quarter. Got a ways to go. Um, you know, that they could wind up having a really interesting 2025. Uh, and, you know, they, they have some debt that they need to pay off. They'd be able to do that. Uh, and, I mean, I don't know if they're quite ready for shareholder returns, but uh, certainly would be able to, uh, you know, return to, you know, reasonable prosperity and it puts money in the bank. So it's that, that's kind of an interesting one I'm thinking about. Got it. Yeah, I was checking them out before our talk as well. And they had a really good, I don't want to say, I want to make this, I want to make sure I say this right. They had a good sell off. Their chart looks interesting if you're a value investor. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, costs are the issue up there. Um, yeah. You know, they, they have it, they have one mind that they really need to bring on. Um, uh, and, you know, in order to, that it, Kaiser, to really lower the overall cost profile of the company. Um, and they're not, they're not well capitalized enough to do it yet. I don't, I don't think, um, so, you know, it's just, but it's one that I've got on the list there and we're kind of waiting and watching and, uh, yeah. it's, uh, you know, I sized it up last year, uh, and then, and then cut it in August when they got to this windfall settlement from the Pennsylvania, uh, uh, Department of Transportation. Um, but, uh, but. It, it's back down to levels where, you know, I think you at least got a head scratch a little bit and see, uh, and, uh, see how things work. That, it's, it's a, fu it's a fun little one to, to take a look at. Yeah. So build your list, everybody build, start building lists at the very least. Well, Matt, um, I'll end on this is you have a great following, uh, on YouTube, um, and Twitter, but I want to say this too. I, I was surprised. They're really surprised, but. I, yeah, I was surprised just uh, how many people request updates, interviews. Let's hear from Matt. I don't know if that's because you were on vacation or whatever, but, uh, you know, a lot of people enjoy uh, listening to you, enjoy your work. So I wanted to give you that. And uh, I'm going to let Trader Ferg uh, let him know and send him this interview. I'm sure he'll uh, he'll really enjoy it. So uh, just want to thank you. One of the best in the industry, well, the best in the industry in, in coal. And one of the the kindest, uh, most honest, I think, uh, analysts out there. So I just want to thank you for that, Matt. Well, well, well thanks, man. I mean, you know, it's uh, it's it's been a pretty wild, uh, uh, you know, sort of middle of my career here. You know, as I think I told you last time, I didn't really expect to come back around and be, you know, a full time coal analyst. You know, at any point in time over the past <laughs> right. eight, ten years, uh, you know, I, I diversified up the up the chain up through iron ore and steel, and then did base metals, precious metals, and uh, you know, battery metals and uranium and all, all kinds of different, uh, commodity markets, you know, in order to, to kind of catch my bets, you right. know, and, and here we are where, where this commodity has just become, you know, really vitally important around, around the globe. And even, even though we're on the, you know, the back half of this, uh, you know, of this, of this current cycle and this last price run, um, it's just, uh, it's been such a blast to, to, you know, kind of rekindle friendships in the industry and and you know like like i said before like i'm I'm happy to be you know a, a you know representative for the industry and, and an independent voice for it because there's it's it, the industry's gotten such a bad rap over the last decade yeah. uh, and there's so many so many fantastic people involved in it you know i just want nothing but the best for them and 
you know, and for these uh, for these great companies that are creating jobs in, in my home state of West Virginia. Uh, so it's uh, it, it's hard for me not to be biased, you know, in, in yeah. that regard, uh, because we, we want all these guys to succeed. Uh, and, and, you know, and we're still, you know, very much focused on, on long term. But, um, uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's just been a privilege here to uh, to to be uh, to be in this position here for the last little bit. So uh, grateful for, for your viewership, obviously, and uh, for everybody else who tuned in. No problem. And it's very well deserved. So thanks, Matt. It's always a pleasure. I'll have you on and again in, uh, in about three months. We'll see where the market's at. Anytime. Thanks a lot. Thanks.